Hello and welcome to the catch up. Today's guest, fishing superstar, former Olympian, he's conquered both worlds, sport and fishing, none other than Mr. All Star, Dean Macy. Dean, <laughs> All Star. Thank you for coming along, mate. My pleasure. Um, I am going to, before we get started and punish Dean with questions, say that we are at the historic Raysbury complex and there are planes buzzing over our head because we're in the middle of Heathrow flight path. So, sound wise, I apologise, but we will do our best. Secondly, if you see me look down at my lap, I'm looking at my phone because I've got the questions on it. My memory is going in my old age. Oh! So, it's Dean's right hand rod. Mmm, that's the one. And we could get interrupted by a bite or two, hopefully. Right, Dean. Yes, mate, yes. We're going to start at the very beginning, mate. Talk me through your childhood, your introduction to angling as Oof. well. Um, my introduction to angling was different to the vast majority of other people because actually I didn't have any interest in fishing as a young kid. And I mean up to the age of sort of like eight or nine. What The, the thing that interested me was that my old man had a couple of rods, some 13 foot old sort of long orange float rods, which would they weighed as much as a pole vault pole, do you know what I mean? They were, <laughs> I've still got them, and even today, I'm a strong old boy, but to hold them, I don't know where he used to fish, or I don't know where anyone back then used to yeah, fish yeah, for them. Cool. Um, but in his old black seat box was one of these old toolboxes, which he used to use as a tackle box. And yeah. in said tackle box was a dirty, great diver's knife, like a Rambo jobby, do you know what I mean? And all I wanted to do when I got home from school was I used to creep into the garage, get the tackle box down, get the knife out, and I used to chase my sister around the garden with it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, as you do. Classic Canvey Island, mate. So, some, yeah, exactly, yeah, that's it. <laughs> and anyway, so one day I, I did exactly the same as what I was normally doing, but he can't, my dad came home early, so I snuck back into the garage, pulled it away, and as I let, went to leave the garage, he walked in and he went, boy, you've been playing my fishing gear? And I thought, well, yeah, absolutely, that's exactly what I've been doing. Anyway, that Christmas, I got given all this fishing gear for Christmas. No I was way. like, oh, mate, what's happening? I had no interest. Where's the knife? Yeah, you know, <laughs> the knife was in there. Was yeah, the knife was in there. That was cool. Anyway, but a, a, two months, maybe three months later, it was cold. And um, anyway, I got grounded. And I thought, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out in the garage, get all my fishing gear, <laughs> lovely, out, brolly up. I'm going to put the reel onto the re uh, rod and just set it all up and just like sort of just see what it's all about. Yeah. And I sat there, I put the brolly up and it started to rain. And I went from a miserable kid of maybe 10 years old, sitting in the garden all on my own because my parents had grounded me for a week for doing something that I'd obviously never done because I was as good as gold, yeah, yeah. Um, to like, I was transported from that miserable kid into like Narnia where I was in my own little world. And that was it. And I thought, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and find yeah. a little pond and see what it's all about. And I was casting, I was backwinding like this as I was casting. I got into so much mess because I didn't have a clue what a bail arm was, no. but I learned. And, on the third session, I caught a skimmer. Right. A manky, horrible old skimmer. But that was it. After that, I was hooked. So, essentially, your dad at that point didn't take you to. You learned all those fundamentals just going out yourself. I'll tell you what I did. My grandparents, so literally from that moment, I was yeah. obsessed. And yeah. I, I probably hadn't actually wet a line properly. So what they did back in the days, they like they bought me a couple of magazines. I looked at the magazines. I just set some float stops up, and you know, remember the old Drennan ledger stops where you just sl you slid a collar up your line, yes. just put a peg in it. Yeah. Right. That that was all I was literally doing, you know, and just tying a hook on, you know, like sort of like you do your lace up. Didn't have a scooby. But the big thing that, that the, the thing that actually helped me the most was remember the old art of fishing binders. That's exactly the same as yeah, me. The, the black ones with a spike it. on it. Yeah, that's it. That you yeah. you, you bought you bought a, a tiny little thin magazine every single week and you just pulled it apart and put that sheet in there, that sheet in there, and you built up your Know Your Fish, um, Watercraft, um, Celebrity Angler, whatever yeah. the, the, the genres were, and that was it, mate. And all my homework, the only homework I ever completed when I was a kid, was I was, I was sitting indoors just totally writing off. Yeah, yeah like plagiarism. You know, Straight to copy. The, utter copy, and Thank even you. the drawings, I'd just put a sheet of tracing paper over the top, <laughs> do the old trick, tracing paper onto normal paper, scribble over the top, get your outline job done. That's mega. Yeah. I had the same thing, mate. They were brilliant. Yeah, they were. Absolutely yeah, yeah. I gave them to some young lad who wanted to learn how to fish a little while ago, because he wanted to come out of me. I said, you're not going to learn anything from me, mate. Read them. So, another question, but you've sort of touched on it, but in a bit more depth, what, what captivated you in particular about fishing? You said about Narnia the, it being in the outdoors. The just, just the yeah. outdoors. I was even... Even as a kid before then, I was I was obsessed with just running around forests and climbing trees and finding owl poo, you know, and then pulling all the fur apart and getting like a little mouse 
skull or anything like that. I was obsessed with the outdoors, you know. And, and even when I was probably 13, 14, my parents used to drop me off on the way to work to like Danbury Lakes, me and a mate. And we used to sit there and fish until the sun come up, catching loads of tension rudd and stuff under this tree. And when the fishing went dead, we just played run outs. I just loved being outdoors. Yeah. But it's, I suppose it's the escapism that I like now more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. and feel the outdoor element in there. One hundred percent, yeah. Perfect. In terms of fishing influences, no, yeah. Throughout the course of obviously your progression from that starting point, mm -hmm. who have been your sort of significant influences in your fishing? John Wilson. Yeah. And more, uh, and to the day more now, I would say Nigel Bothaway because yeah. I, I got there's a certain stage in your life, particularly in okay, look, let's. In a roundabout way, I'm going to say my fishing career, because it's not what I do for a living, it's half of what I do for a living. But, but I got to a point where I started taking myself and my fishing a little bit too seriously. And I remember ringing Nigel up one day and he, he, he sort of, he was like that mirror reflection. He was just like, mate, just have a word with yourself, you know? A bite's a bite or whatever. I can't remember what it was. Yeah. And, and I was proper stroppy and, and stressed out. And, and I've fished with Nigel an awful lot over the years now, and, and he's helped me become so much more relaxed, you know? I don't worry about, as, as long as I fish technically quite well, yeah. I don't worry about blanking or, or, no. or getting duffed up by, from the next swim, you know? I can make a flyer look crap at times, and I can also make a, a naff swim look like a flyer, you know? We all have our day, fishing, that's the great, exactly, that's the great thing. Yeah. Um, but John growing up was, um, I still watch John's shows on, on YouTube, and I'll tell you why. One, because I, I used to love the way he presented. Two, I loved the places he used to go to. It was, it was, it was very much, he was one of the first people to go to, the, you know, to, to Lake Nasser and catch those oh, Nile yeah. perch. He was one of the first people to go to the, to the Carvery and, Carvery? <laughs> He's Carvery hungry. down the He's already. <laughs> Adam Rooney's told me yeah. about hungry you Yeah, um, but, and, and catch the Marcia. But I watch it because it makes me feel like I used to do when I was a kid. And ironically, when I was, when I was trying to, that, the sort of year leading up to me turning professional was a, a, as an athlete. Yeah. I had two jobs, so I worked from 6.45 in the morning till 12 as a lifeguard, which was great because that's where I met my wife. Right, so brilliant, yes, absolutely. Didn't have to go in and save anybody, cleaned a lot of windows and toilets, fell asleep on the, you know, on the side of the swimming pool loads of times, but I met my wife, you know, woman of my dreams. It's alive, she Be needed Best it. capture I'll ever have. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, but then I used to stake boxes, right? Uh, yeah. a, a warehouse from 10 in the evening till, uh, sorry, from six in the evening till 10 in the evening. And the gap in between was when I used to do all my training. So I was full time to a degree, but I still had to pay for my warm weather training spikes and help out my parents um, with, with fuel to take me to competitions. Yeah. But I used to stop, I used to finish stacking the boxes at 10 o'clock. And my mum or my dad used to pick me up from that job, right? And it was a good 25 minute run home. I mean, a good 25 minute. And go fishing started at half past 10. So I knew if I was shit, or if I had a crap run, I'm sorry about right. my smell, <laughs> right? That um, I'd be late for John. Yeah. And ding, 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 ding. I'd never be late. Yeah. It was such, I mean, in, beyond sort of a generation, more generations even, the yeah. people that watch it now, it is inspiring stuff even to this day. Uh, 100%, 100 mate, okay. because because those days we will never see again. No, never no, see again. Things move on, don't they? Yeah. Um, in terms of your fishing, from yeah. that beginning to sort of how you progressed into what you are now, which is an all-rounder, how have you progressed in your fishing? Have you sort of, I don't know, had times where you've been concentrated on a species? I have, yeah. Or have you, yeah, how's it gone? Yeah, well, See, after I started learning, or teaching, learning myself how to fish, I should learn myself how to talk English first, shouldn't I? Um, after, I yeah. after I taught myself how to fish, the ver I mean the basics, yeah. you know, and I, I, I blanked most of the time, I didn't care, you know, I got turned over on the surface all the times. Um, but I joined a club called the Lobster Smack Freshwater Angling Club, and I, I met a guy, well, I met two guys really, but I met a guy called Les Westbeach and a guy called Joel Blackburn. And those two took me under my wing, or under their wing, and they used to drive me once a month from, uh, from we were all based on Canvey, and they used to drive me from Canvey to these matches all over the country. And I, I used to blank every single, well, I didn't blank, but I never used to frame. I won, I won a fur and feather once, but I fair looked a carp un, under the wing. 11 pound, 11 ounces. Did I tell them it was hooked in the mouth? Did I eck? It didn't matter, actually, it was match fishing. Yeah, you can take it, <laughs> yeah, you? Exactly, but did I eck? So I came home with this 12 pound turkey or whatever it was, and my mum. Oh, yeah. Get on the turkey. 100%, mate. I was, that was it. Best Christmas ever. Anyway, but 
that taught me an awful lot about various different genres of fishing, but it also got me right into the match fishing, because at the time I really loved my competing at track and field, or various different sports at that yeah. time, and obviously the match fishing became a big part. But in those matches, I, I mean, I, there were five hour matches on like the Hughes or the Warren, but the, yeah. the best part of those wasn't, wasn't catching fish or the odd time when I framed or even caught some fish, it was, it was going, walking around and just watching people in various different swims, how you're targeting the chub, how you're targeting the bream, how you're targeting the tench or the carp or something. And the best part after that was the weighing. Because my net was inevitably empty or yeah, it'd have a gudgeon or a stickleback or an eel or something in there. And I'd go round to someone who's fishing on the bend with a nice long crease up to a tree and he goes, yeah, just run a stick float down all day. And I'd be like, what do you catch? And he'll have seven chub in the net. And I'd be like, wow. Oh my God, yeah. they're only two, two and a half pound, but yeah. back then they were massive. Yeah, of course. And, and so I went through the match fishing scene and I remember fishing the match, it's getting long by the way, but I've, you know, remember I'm over 40s, this is a lot of years. Yeah, yeah. But I went through the match fishing scene. I remember fishing a match over Tyler's Common, an open match on the Friday, which was my day off. And I was fishing 11 and a half metres up to this sort of middle, it's like a snake lake, but there was islands dotted right the way through the middle. So it's 11 and a half, 12 metres to the islands, okay. you know, and you, you fished opposite each other. And it was a howling wind and I'm sitting there and these, I mean, this is 25 years ago, right? These poles are doing this, you know what I mean? They're like pieces of wet spaghetti. And I didn't really frame, but I remember waking up next morning and all my sides were hurting and my ribs were sore and I'm thinking, I've got to go and run five 300s, which for people that don't know is a hell of a lactic session, right? And I'm thinking, this should be a day off, I should be fresh. <laughs> should be relaxed. I was like, I was like this is, there's got to be something better, or, or, or not better, but certainly more of a chilled and relaxing. Yeah. So I went and bought myself some crappy old Mitchell reels and some yeah. Shimano Hyperloops, right? Nice. Two and a quarters, which were yeah. big rods back then, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? Fuzzed them out on Crow's Eve, caught the Armadillo Common, which is the biggest common in the lake. Thought, this is easy. I had about 13 fish that trip and started carp fishing. Wow. And then I was carp fishing all the way up until 2005. Yeah. Uh, sorry, 2000, yeah, 2005. But in 2004, I did the, two, I did the Athens Olympics. Yeah. And I come forth again. And I was doing an interview with someone, BBC, whatever, and they was like, oh, you must be really disappointed, fourth place again. I was thinking, hold on, the last one weren't a great result, but I should have come 10th today. So fourth place is an absolute mega result. How many medals have you got, Mr. Report? I, I, should, have, I should have said that, but it's <laughs> press, isn't it, right? But they said, what are you going to do now? And I said, I'm just going to go to France fishing for the week. Yeah. Two days later, my agent rings me up, says, Discovery have been on the phone, do you want to do a show? And that was, that wow. was the beginning of all my shows. That was on course with Dean Macy, and yeah, that was I when I met... Steph Orak, yeah. Phil Smith, yeah. um, uh, Pete Redding, and many, many more anglers. And I just basically went to their local venues and fished with them. And, and from there, I've never looked back. Carp uh, fishing is a big part of what I do. Yeah, of course. But there's, I was, I was at you earlier, didn't I? If you think of the rainbow, red and yellow and pink and green, orange nice. and purple and blue, if red, which is the main dominant colour, is your carp fishing, yeah. I still want to experience all the other colours. And at certain months of the year, you know, I'd rather be rud fishing than carp fishing. I'd rather be barbel fishing than rud fishing or doing whatever. And, and that's it. And it's, it's really followed from, it's followed on from a track and field. Whereas yeah. like when I train, I wouldn't just be a jumper or a runner or a thrower. Because that yeah. would bore the living daylights out of me doing that week in, week out. I had 10 events to master, which, you know, you're never going to, but I got as good as most. And, and every week was different. Yeah. And that's the same in me fishing. You know, I can, I can literally look at the weather conditions and go, yeah. you know, yeah. it's, it's bright sunshine, not a breath of wind, it's 30 degrees, where am I going to go? I know where I'm going to go, up on the fens, because then rud have it. Yeah. You know, or yeah. it's minus three, frosty as heck, high pressure in the winter, go and find some grayling. Yeah, happy days. And everything else in between, yeah. No, brilliant, mate. Yeah. We've got to touch on it, because as you said there, you sort of glossed over a mega athletics career, decathlon, yep. Olympic Games, World Championship medals, a lot. Mm -hmm. Obviously, alongside your angling progression, there was obviously a lot of progression and time spent in your development athletics-wise. Yeah, yeah, Talk yeah. us through that and how those two sort of married together, or was there sort of conflict? Uh, if I was, if I was obsessive, if I had the obsessive nature about fishing back then as I have now, yeah. then there probably would have been conflict. But I, I, but I didn't because fishing was a getaway for me then. And it was, uh, I mean, I still wanted to fish well. I still had high expectations of myself and I still wanted to go certain places to catch certain fish. But, yeah. but it was a real small part of my life. But then at that time, it was just, it was a break, you know? Whereas the athletics was the career. Yeah. But, but the flip side of that was that when I stepped off the track, I needed to do something that was completely the polar opposite to the track and field because I needed to break mentally from that as well. Because, you know, as much as I had plenty of 
there's plenty of events to go from, you know, in, in any particular day, let alone week and month. Yeah. You know, I wasn't one to eat, sleep and, and you know, athletics yeah. all the time. Yeah. I'd train from nine, I'd be ready to go for 9 a.m. So, yeah. you know, first step on the track at 9 a.m., all warmed up, ready to rock. I'd be done by 2 p.m. And then after, I was saying to you earlier, was, after, um, earlier on, sometimes yeah. I would drive from Canvey yeah. up, to, up to the Kennet, which is 120 odd miles, yeah. to fish from 5 p.m. to 11 p.m., you know, and then drive home, get home at two o'clock, and then be ready to rock again at yeah. nine o'clock in the morning, which I know a lot of people do for jobs. But, you know, uh, Getting up and doing a nine to five is slightly different to getting up and having to ping yourself over a five meter high pole vault pole or, yeah. or you know, run yourself to the point where you puke. Yeah, you know, exactly. physically so demanding. So yeah. sleep deprivation was a big thing. Massively, I was going to say, where's, yeah. where's your rest in that, really? Well, it wasn't, you know, but, yeah. but back then the barbell were that big and that prolific, but it was worth <laughs> it. it. Was worth it. <laughs> so I only did it once a week. So if I was a bag of spanners at training, I'd go, oh, sorry, Greg, <laughs> I had a bit of an upset tummy last night or something. Yeah, you throw an excuse in there. Yeah, of course. Did they all know that you fit? I mean, I, I, you know, I, I popped, I had a sore calf every now and yeah, again, of course I did. Yeah, I remember, I remember going over to the River Lee once and just as I was leaving, I got out of the car and I climbed a tree and I found, oh mate, I've never seen a swim full of big barbel and chub like it on the River Lee. Oh, ev anywhere. I've never seen them anywhere like this. They were just stacked like the size of a car bonnet, probably five or six big barbel, you know, like 10, 10 to 14 pounds, you know, like big ones, right? And there was chub in there that looked as big as the 10 pounder. They were absolutely <laughs> ginormous. I thought, right, I need a gallon of maggots tomorrow and I need a day off training. Yeah. So I was like, Greg, do you reckon I should come down to Crystal Palace tomorrow and do all my hurdling and, and pole vaults? Why is that? I said, because my right calf's a little bit yes. tight from running back to the car to get me polies, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? He's like, no, nah, you're better off, better off having a day off. I'm like, yeah, sweet. I rang up the old local angling direct. Can I? Can I order? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can I order straight a gallon of maggots? Yeah, yeah. That was it. Straight down there. Blanked. Really? Yeah, yeah. Should've Actually, ironically, I pulled my car off that next no time. No way. Did. It, I, mean, I did. Yeah, yeah. Talk about talk it up. Was there ever a part of you in competition? Because obviously, there you, we talked about probably not a physical rest, but there's a mental rest, an escapism when you go out and you fish and yeah. you focus on that rather than training. Was there ever a part of you in competition? at the very pinnacle of decathlon and sport, Olympic Games, World Championship, whatever it may be, where your brain was on fishing, not on no, competition. No, I'd like To be fair, when I used to run the 1500 metres, which at the end of the two days, you've done nine events, your, your body's already wrecked anyway, you know, and you hobble to the start line. I used to do random things like, at, I mean, don't get me wrong, my 1500 was quite strong, so I didn't have too many people in front of me. But what I'd do is I'd look at matey boy in front of me and go, right, 997, that's his number. Matey boy in front of him is 1226. So I'd try and add them up. And by the time I'd got anywhere close, the bell would go and I'd go, oh, one more lap, and then chug off. But I'd, I'd never, I'd never, I'd never set off in the 1500 metres and go, oh, I'll tell you what, a slip D would be really good in that situation. <laughs> <laughs> that, that weren't the, no, it weren't the case, I'm afraid. And then obviously, career-wise, you won two world championship medals. Mm -hmm. You finished fourth twice in two Olympic Games. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Athens and the previous. What was the previous? Sydney. In Sydney. Yeah, the biggest one of all. I'm gonna. I mean, you can talk about that in a bit more detail if need be, but it might. Yeah. But a brilliant career by whoever standards apart from whichever journal had an interview with you, mate. Unbelievable yeah. achievement. Brilliant. Um, mm. I would not know what at all that is like, but mega commitment, mega mega result. At any point in that sort of spell of your career or, or post-career did you ever think that fishing would be what it is to you now no no and to be fair i've had to you know don't get me wrong i, I followed my heart yeah. when it comes to every, like even when i was competing and people used to like when you won medals because back then i mean track and field now is ever so prolific when it comes to medals and i, I i'd go as far as saying it sort of cheapened them a little bit because when you come home from a, an olympics or a world champs and you're one of three people that have won medals like there's some your big deal oh. when there's 25 people won medals yeah, yeah the, the love sort of spreads out a little bit do you know what i mean but um i Tell me the question again, go on. I've got a really good point, I've just forgot. Um, the question was, like, did you, did you ever think oh, you right. sort of fit, you'd be yeah. sort of in this position? No, no, but the, so some of the opportunities that when I retired because of that yeah. um, were significant. And, and even when I, like, I'd come back from, a, that's where I was going, even when I was won the medals, you know, yeah. I'd, I'd finish the sort of season, end of September time, and I would work as much as I could up to December 
And that was it. I'd earn enough money to I'd get, I'd be like, right, that's going to see me through at least the next 18 months. And yeah. that's it. My agent used to hate me, pull his hair out. Oh, come on, they've offered you this. Yeah. You. And that was it. I just wanted to train. I wanted to do my job. You know, yeah. I didn't want to go around and, and just please a load of corporates here and there. And but, I mean, it was good money that was offered, but, but I just did my own thing. I did it my way. Yeah. Um, and I've had to sort of, to a degree, to get to the point where I am now, I've had to pass over an awful lot of other commentary gigs, Channel 4 work yeah. and things like that, to, to, to commit the time that's needed to do the fishing gurus, the all-stars, the big fish-offs. Um, and as much as my wallet has suffered, do I care? Not a chance. No, not a chance. I wouldn't go back and change it for the world because I, I, I love being on the bank. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, for the vast majority of the time, I, I, I just love chatting to anglers. It doesn't yeah. matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter what you do for a living, you know. You know, it doesn't matter if you're six foot five or five foot six. We've both got the same chance. Seven. Five foot seven, yeah. <laughs> yeah, reckon? no, no, exactly. No, that's mega. Lasting impressions of your career for yourself. So take angling out of the equation yeah. and where you've got to because you've done brilliantly, subsequently, you followed your heart. Your athletic career, yeah. Happy with it? Not happy with it? Any regrets? Anything you wish you did differently? One total wipeout. <laughs> That's mega. Top of the tree. Oh, no, you also haven't mentioned my Commonwealth Games. Com oh, Commonwealth Games. There you go, yeah. So that was the highlight, in fairness. Yeah. You know, it was, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, winning the World Championship silver and bronze medal is epic, you know, being the second or third best on the planet. That's the best right. all-round athletes these are. These are people that can run, jump, yeah. throw. They're, co exactly. they're coordination, you know. That's amazing. But, but I would have finished my career completely different mentality to I now to what I've got now if I didn't stand on the top of the rostrum at least really? once yeah 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 because in 2002 Commonwealth Games came to came to the UK yeah, it was yeah. in Manchester yeah. and uh, and I blew my hamstring up two weeks before and and I and it was one with a substandard performance that was ni not a thousand points less than what my best was and probably 700 points less than what I was in shape to do so I was devastated mate. Yeah, I didn't take it very, yeah didn't take it very well in fairness um, and fishing helped me out on that as well because I just went away sorted myself out had a good look in the mirror came back and my missus was like right what do you want to do and I'm like gonna have another go yeah. and then four years later I went to Melbourne uh, and and won it in Australia, which was fantastic, because Australians do sport better than anyone, you know, because they're superstars out yeah. there. You haven't got the only way as Essex that are superstars over here. No. You've got sportsmen that are like superstars over there, so that's wicked. But, but that was the one that's defined. It wasn't the best decathlon, wasn't my best score, wasn't my best points. You know, I didn't beat the best opposition, but it's but it's just my gold medal. It's my, it was my moment, you know. And don't get me wrong, I, I when I won a, a bronze in Edmonton, I scored a PB. So I still walked away from that with my chest pumped out, and I, I felt like a million dollars, you know. But there was two better guys than me, you know. When I when I won the silver in in uh, Seville in '99, that was a, a PB score as well, and that was what broke me through into a, becoming a professional yeah, athlete. Yeah, so yeah. that that was phenomenal. So and even the Olympics, mate. I mean, the fourth place in Sydney weren't great. I, th I felt like I should have certainly medaled, if not won it, because there was less than a hundred points between fourth and first. Yeah. And when you're talking about eight and a half thousand points, that's not a big gap, not no. a big percentage. But Athens fourth was superb because I should have come eighth. Yeah. You know, there was yeah, loads yeah. of guys that should have beat me that year because I weren't in great shape. But I just delivered in the two days that I needed to. So, looking back, to yeah, to think, I mean, to think of all the athletes that have passed in, you know, since I've retired and obviously before me, to have your lowest ever global position to be fourth. Yeah. Yeah, I do look back with quite a lot of pride now. But actually, it's taken me. I mean, I've been retired what 11 years now, but it's taken me. It's taken me a good decade to look back with pride because the first couple of years I, I, I was thinking if only I'd have done that different, if only I'd have yeah. done that different, it could have been a bit better, it could have been a bit whatever. But, I, but now I look back with slightly older, wiser mm. eyes and really mate, I'll be honest, I was probably the sixth best athlete talent wise on the planet. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was better people than me. There was a couple of Americans that were just yeah, you wake us up in the middle of the night when we're not in shape and they whoop me by a thousand points, you know? <laughs> I had to train myself into being yeah. competitive. Here's the story. So your lifestyle now is TV shows, fishing, whatever else. Yeah. Do you miss those days competing? No. No? No, 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 no. I did. Again, I did for the probably first five years. Yeah. Um, but now I'm a long way north of 40 and, and I'm... I, I don't have a, com I do have a competitive bone in my body, yeah. but but a competitive bone, like the competitive nature of a human being, isn't a, isn't a, a trait that is, that people warm to. 
it tends to make you quite selfish. Yeah, of course. You know, and I, me I remember my wife saying to me about two years after I retired, she says, you're a much nicer person now than you really? was when you was competing. I was like, what? I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> I, was like, I was like, what do you mean? She was like, you was really distant. Yeah. And now my wife was, we, she was with me for the whole of my career, you know. We've been yeah. together, what, 11 years at that point. And for, yeah, a, for, for a decade, for her to put up with me when I was distant. Not, not a nice thing to, to, to no, hear, I, to be fair. Because, I, you know, I knew I, was, I knew I was quite selfish at times and you have to be. Yeah, but there's, no, there is, there's still no excuse for it. But, no. but I've made up for it in the last decade. Good, yeah, yeah. Yes, you have. I send it down to Lakeside with 100 quid every time I go to France <laughs> for a go. week. Go shopping. Yeah. Um, no, of course you made up for it. Um, so your career afterwards, you're now involved with the likes of Guru, yep. Corda, Mainline. Tracker. Tracker. Yep. So how did all that come to be in terms of, in terms of where you stand in fishing with those brands? It's, I really don't know. I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> no, I know. I mean, I was literally, I was just fishing a tiny little pond when, well, it was, I'd come off the back of the 2004 Olympics, got offered a show. From yeah. that show, I started getting sponsored by Nash. Yeah. Um, when that finished, I, I, I thought to myself, oh, I'm just going to enjoy me fishing. Um, and then ended up signing a, a contract with JRC after coming back from Gillam's and, and doing really well out there. Stuart knew someone from JRC and said, yeah, you want to sign this yeah. guy up, he's half decent or whatever. And then once I'd signed with JRC, Ali literally courted me. Yeah. Like for, for probably six months. Yeah. You know, I'd turn up to a lake and he was there. there. Yeah, he'd send me some love hearts at text. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. Valentine's Day, yeah, I'd nice. get it. And it was, it was ever so nice. He took us out and, and sort of wined us, dined us a couple of times. And, and in fairness, everything he promised me over the last probably eight years, nine years now, yeah, it's, it's, it's come true. So um, yeah. I, it, was, it was a good move for me. I didn't, yeah. ever want, I didn't ever want at any stage fishing to be 50% of what I do for a living. Okay. But... But, but it's ended up that way, yeah. and I don't regret any of it, no. you know? All right, there's certain times, that it's like winning a lottery ticket at times and not being able to cash it in. When yeah. you're sitting there and the fish, the fish are pluming and showing like this, you've got your spots rocking, you've been baiting it for two hours and the camera crew are still over there eating their breakfast yeah, or something, and by the time they, you know, they're getting all sorted and stuff, and, and then you're in, it's 11 o'clock in the morning, sun's out, wind's dropped, and the fish yeah. have all gone. So that, that's frustrating, but that's part and parcel of the you filming. Yeah, and the filming and fishing are two different things. Oh. When I'm filming, that's their time. When I'm fishing, that's my time, yeah. you know? Yeah. And ironically, I mean, people ask me this, and they're like, What's, I, I don't understand the difference. And I'm like, look, yeah. if I lose a fish from my own fishing, it's not nice. I, I, get the, I get the horrible pain in my belly, like yeah. the same as everyone else, right? It's not, you know, if I lose a fish for a show, all right, I'd rather it be in the back of the net, mm. but I'll go, hmm, drama intensity makes yeah. the makes the next one seem a little bit more do you it's know what I mean? Plot, it's a thickener, isn't exactly it? yeah and not that you you drop them off on on purpose but no. you know it's it's a totally different ball game yeah no too right I, well i can empathize to a lower level so to speak yeah. but i know exactly but it's, it makes a good story if it all comes good yeah, right of course yeah it does. yeah it makes the, a shocker the, the, <laughs> the director's in the background when you drop one drop one he's going yes he's going yeah that'll be a cracking show so you are awesome in terms of personality but also presenting to camera mate you've been on youtube i've seen you on telly mm. um did all that sort of media side of stuff presenting and fishing to camera come naturally or was it sort of a process um no if you i mean please don't no one do it but if you watched all eight seasons of fishing gurus you can definitely tell that every season gets better we're and better. playing them before yeah the yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> reruns of all eight of them but but even now i mean i mean presenting straight down the camera as long as you know what you're saying and you don't take yourself too seriously and you look through the lens and you talk to someone yeah. you know then it, that side of things has always come quite easy for me cool. you know and and just being natural and not taking yourself too seriously and just having a laugh on the bank. Christ, I mean, that's what we do anyway when we go fishing, you know, so I just don't change anything. I think the one thing that I've got that I, I do, I have watched in this season of um, All Stars is I get very excitable, but I think a lot of that is because you've got to remember when you're filming for a camera, yeah. or filming for a show, you've got an extremely limited amount of time. The time is the oh, yeah. biggest one. You know, you'll turn up for 12 hours during the day, right? But that 12 hours by the time you've done the intros, the getting into the swims, the setting up, soon turns into eight hours of fishing, mm. you know? And, and generally that eight hours is through the time of the day. You don't really need to be fishing anyway. And, um, and so with the, you know, you're paying two cameramen, yeah. good for you hundred quid each. You've got yeah. a director and a sound man and someone else, you know, so all the money mounts up. 
And because of the time limitations and the time you're fishing, right, the pressure is tenfold. Oh, yeah. And I think what it does, it makes a 15 pounder feel like a 50 pounder when it goes in the back of the net. And you're just like, Wah! <laughs> so yeah, I do get a little bit excited, but when I watch it back and I still, I'm, I'm probably the same as everyone else, I cringe. There's certain bits that I watch of myself on the box, I go, good job, Dino. But I'm the worst critic. I, I, you know, if someone goes, you could have done better there. I've already seen it. Have you? Oh, I can't yeah. watch myself back, mate. I find it absolutely painful. The, the problem is, though, I, I have to watch myself back because yeah. as much as I was there doing the filming, I watch a lot of the links to camera back afterwards because I'm like, well, if the fish has gone back, I'm stuck anyway. But just to make sure that the end of the day piece and the leading into Ooh. the next day, yeah, it was all nice and smooth. Yeah. And then I go and do the voiceover. Sure. But the first time I actually see the final edit with my voiceover and everything clean is when it's on the box. Yeah. You know, I mean, by the time it's on the box, I've probably seen the show in yeah. different stages four or five times, yeah. but the, the final product is when everyone else sees it. Well, you know, Dean, it is all about the edit, as Lewis was telling me. They can make you look <laughs> out any air they want, yeah, exactly. Make or break, it's taking us seven hours to get this far. <laughs> That's just doing your ear. Yeah, exactly. Good from you. Um, have, you uh, have you had any TV show shockers? As in, I don't know, weather, not a result, you've personally not had a great time filming it. Has anything sort of shocking happened all the, throughout the course of any of the TV that you filmed? We've not had many. I mean, this is this is the thing. I mean, I know, I know, I know a couple of anglers that are much better at catching big fish than me. You know, they're very driven, one they're one track mind. You know, they don't fish for bites, they are yeah, they're just blinkered. Yeah, big fish anglers. But yeah. But, but the one thing that they need is time, and the one thing you don't get when you're filming is time. And, and whether they could deliver for the camera, I very much doubt it, because it's not their way of fishing. Um, and so actually, if you look at it over the, I don't know, what we're talking, we're talking 10 years now. That's a long time. Yeah, I mean, the vast majority of the time, we've been able to deliver yeah. something, you know. I, rem I'm, I remember on the Y once, and we was filming, I think it was like season seven of Fishing, or, um, um, of Gurus, which was on Sky. and. Yeah. Um, I remember turning up to this stretch and, and, and the bailiff showed us around and then literally left and he was like, right, okay. And this was the second day of the season and this particular bailiff um, fished it the opening day of the season, right? And he, he knew the stretch like the back of his hand and, and he had two fish. And I'm like, oh, wow. mate, we've got to do a 40-minute show. Yeah. Like, you know, like, pfft. Anyway, so I did literally, we just tried to feel content, you know, I was wading out, picking up different bits of weed, showing them spots with underwater cameras, where I'd lay rigs, where the barbel roots would be and all that stuff, you know, trying to really fill it with decent in information, but just bulking it out, because I'm yeah. thinking, we ain't getting much, we ain't getting much fish here. yeah. So anyway, I went stalking, nicked a couple of small chub, this, that and the other, and um, went to the swim where he caught his fish from, yeah. right? Flicked out, I, I, because there weren't no fish, well, there was a very limited amount of fish there, I thought, right, I just put a big lead on the bag. I didn't want to chuck a feeder every 20 minutes and just build, building the swim's great when there's a volume of fish there, but yeah. building the swim when you're looking for a lone bite, it's not the one, right? Lowered it straight into the middle of the stream and sat back, right? And I turned around to James Armstrong, who was sort of helping direct that shoot, and I, I went like that to talk to him, and he's going, like that, and I was like, what's wrong with him? He's having a bit of a funny yeah, turn. Right. I turn around, the rod's flat like this, right? <laughs> and I, I kid you not, when you need yeah. a fight to last 10 minutes, this thing went, uh, it done a loop-de-loop -loop around every bit of streamer. I was out to within millimetres of the top of my waders at this particular, like this angle, because the water's so, so powerful, mate. It was the most epic barbell bite, or yeah. fight, that I've had on any of the shows, on the show that I needed it. And sometimes you just get that you just get that luck. Yeah. And I think, yes, you do make your own luck by being in the right place at the right time. And and you know we've we've all had red letter days. But if you have quite a few red letter days, you're obviously doing something right. Yeah, course, do you know what I mean? But but when you're filming and you are very limited for time and you can't really move too much because you know it, like you can't just literally wind the rods in and move to the no, next swim because it's the whole thing has to go. Mate, it's, it's a it's an, it's a it's a good hour. You oh, know yeah. you can't just do it. Um, little bits of luck like that really do help. Yeah. And we've, I mean, All Stars this year, we totally bombed out on the River Po yeah. um, for the catfish. And I looked an absolute leviathan. I didn't even know. It was like the bottom. I was on proper heavy lure fishing gear and it felt like the bottom. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and, the, and the braid just parted and we finished without a fish on that one. And we decided two months later, just to, yeah. out of our own budget, yeah. um, go back and have another go. And it worked out with 140 and 160 yeah. pounder. So that was a blowout. But but we was on the verge of having such an epic show, yeah. we were like, got to find the budget. 
you've got to find the budget. And actually, I had a trip to Parco booked, and I, I cancelled that trip to Parco. To yeah, gave it to a pal. We gave me my deposit back, and I was like, right, I've got 500 quid. That can go towards my trip. And they were like, don't be silly. I was like, no, let's do it. Yeah. You know, and so you're in it. Not because you get paid to be no, there. No, no. I'm in it because I love making yeah, good quality working. shows. And yeah. you can see that you generally can when you see each camera, mate. That enthusiasm that you cringe out, you've said this series about. I love it, mate. It's really endearing, mate. And yeah. testament is my missus watches it. And if my missus watches a fishing show, it must be good. Mate. Yeah, I know if my missus sits through one of my shows, yeah. she's all right. Do you yeah. know the only one? She, <laughs> I'll never forget. This. You know, so the big fish off. We've had a couple of girly yeah. shows, right? Well, we had. Uh, Sally Gunnell and Anna Kelly on I one of the shows. That, yeah. yeah, absolutely brilliant. And she knows Sally, so it was all lovely jubbly. Yeah. But then we had Jessica Hayes and Casey yeah. Batchelor on, yeah. right? And there was a lot of innuendos yeah, on that one. And at the end of that show, I thought it was one of the best shows we've ever done because they would, they would bless them, they were ditzy, they didn't have a clue what they were doing. Jessica, I was telling her what to say. I was just saying, just tell me I'm amazing, give me a kiss. Yeah. She goes, Dean, you're amazing. I was like, what? Right, it was all, it was all funny and laughing. But I turned around after the hour show and I went, what do you think, babe? And she yeah, went, it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, in the phone, mate. oh no. Um, but but other, it, other than no, I did get away of it. But that's the only show when I turn around. I just I was just like. Yeah. Oh. I was like, oh dear. It's the best show I've ever done. I mean, it was the second best show I've ever done. Fun, one of the funniest <laughs> shows to film. No, uh, they were brilliant. Mate. They're all brilliant. In terms of fishing all stars, yep. which is where we're up to now. We're near the end of the series. The series has been mega. I've watched it every Thank single you. Thursday. How did that series sort of come to be? It's just an evolution of the old gurus. Yeah. And so we've moved over from Sky to ITV, yeah. simply changed the name because they didn't want the same name. So oh, okay. I, didn't, I didn't come up with the name. And we're not, we're not claiming that we are all stars. We're right. trying to get to that level where we are all star, all rounders, if, you, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, like you stick me on a seat box, mate. I'm, you know, I'm a fish out of water. Whereas Rooney's mustard. But you take Rooney to a 300 acre mountain lake fishing for carp at 120 yards, and I'm, you know, I know what I'm doing, and Rooney's the fish out of water. So, it's, so we, we've, we've got certain aspects of fishing that he helps me, I help him, and all that stuff, you know, and I think that's good for the show because you've not, you've not got two experts that are just saying, this is how we do it, and taking it for granted. Yeah. When we catch some big fish, Rooney's as surprised and yeah. as like, like that, as, as the punters yeah. that are watching, which I think is really good. So they can relate to him a lot more yeah, than they can relate to, exactly. relate to me. Yeah, because I mean, I do, I pay out my own wallet to go and do trips like that five times a year all yeah. the time, you know? So as much as I love being there, it's, it's comfortable for me, comfortable surroundings, being out on a proper boat, you know, and lowering them down into the trees and stuff. But, um, but really, it, it, we just needed a new format, and ITV don't like half-hour shows. Oh, okay. Yeah, so so it had to be an it had to be an hour show, and where it should have gone out last year, yeah. and it's been delayed a year because of behind-the-scenes issues, edit, editorial bits and bobs like that. Sure. Um, it enabled us to do instead of four one-hour shows, it enabled us to get an extra two shows in. Yeah. So that's why we've had the six. Yeah. So yeah, but but I'll be honest with you. I mean, you never know how it's going to be received. It's like a, making a TV show is like a wedding. You, you you're gonna you, you are gonna annoy someone. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, so if you do laughy bubbly, then the serious anglers yeah, don't cool. like it. If you do serious, then quite frankly, most of the Joe public can't stand it. Yeah. You know, because serious fishing is boring to watch, yeah, right? Yeah, for cool. the for the most part, not yeah. for anglers. Mass but market, though, cool. Yeah, but for an yeah, anglers are a very very niche small market, yeah. mate. We're talking about trying to target millions, not trying to target you know. 20,000. Yeah. Unfortunately in angling it's the it's the serious anglers that have got the biggest voice sometimes yeah, yeah, you know um, but yeah you are you are going to annoy certain people but it's the viewing figures at the end of the day that speaks volumes and tells you whether you've got a decent product or not and we're only two seasons in and the viewing figures have been exceptional so far. We're four shows down I'd like to think that they I mean, I'd like to think that they grow, but really they've been at the point where I'm thinking, let's just, let's just stay there where we are and, and whether, it, whether it's good enough for a third season, I don't control the purse strings, no, I don't no. control the budgets. I'd like to think so, yeah. I really would. And even if we did two, two, in the, two abroad and two in the UK, because I think it's still important to do the UK shows because yeah. it's, it's, it's very easily, in, it's very accessible for most people watching. But the only problem with that is fishing shows, thinking tackle, all of the online content that you see nowadays yeah. and, and fishing gurus uh, and, and all of the other shows that have, you know, cart, what did the one that Rob Hughes used to do? On the bank? Yeah, so cart, the like, bank? it was like a cart talk or cart, well, but anyway, all of them shows have been around the UK for, a long time. for the last 10, 12 years, yeah. right? And so it's hard to do something in the UK that hasn't been done before, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, it's 
So it's so it, so in that respect, it's, it's you know you're not going to get. I mean, if you go back and watch the Croatia show, that yeah. 36 pound River Common, you just don't get situations like that in the UK that often. And the response that we've had from that one moment yeah. over the and still, I mean, it's, it was a week ago today, yeah. still getting people come through. And and of all the Guru shows and the Big Fish Off shows that we've ever done, sure. that moment has given me the most feedback yeah. I've ever had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was drama though, through snag. Oh, was crazy. I, I still to this day, that it was, was a 29 minute battle was from that the how long it was? It was from the cameras turning on. Because I'll tell you this thing, right, what most people don't realise is the cameras were actually like the crew were putting their gear away. Yeah, that's yeah, how close yeah. that's how close to, to it being all over and a complete blob, yeah. right? Um, so we always have a camera on, on the rods. So we never have to fake a bike because we've always got a camera sat yeah, on the rods, yeah. right? So you know this day and age technology and batteries you just leave it there all the time and uh, anyway um, Chris my cameraman my personal cameraman that sort of covers me when we're on the shoots sure. he took his camera away five minutes before and started packing it all down and literally so it was 29 minutes from the cameras turning on picking up the fight where I'm going this fish is ridiculous because before then it had already flat rodded me and pulled me almost in the river anyway because yeah. I was locked up to the far bank and, um, and then that 29 minutes gets crunched down into seven minutes. Now that seems an awful lot, but seven minutes of watching one person pretty much do how one long thing. That works? Yeah, that's a lot of time. You feel that? Though, no, exactly. It. It's a lot of TV time because a, a 20 minute battle would normally get crunched down into three minutes. Yeah. And to double that, everyone it's was going, like well. It's a part, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. It's nearly half of an old fishing guru show. It didn't feel like that at all, mate. And, and you can't get moments like that. I mean, no. I've had moments like that in my own personal fishing yeah. quite a few times. Not, not on a yearly basis, but probably five or six moments like that over the years when I've been travelling abroad and doing various different sort of adventures. Yeah. But to get it on camera, and then instead of it taking me to the far bank, being a, it took me down the near bank, so all the cameras were on, on dry land, sort of getting different angles. It just enabled the perfect moment, really. Yeah, yeah. But I'll tell you another thing, the one, the one shot that none of them got because they were all moving, when I got over the top of the fish and I started feeling it like this, right? I was thinking, something's here. I'm either lifting and dropping a branch, but I'm, I'm like, I can feel it. I put my head under the water and I, I went, still here, it's a big common. Yeah. And in my mind, because I didn't have- You could see it, but I didn't realize you had your head in the water. Yeah, like. when, when my head was above the water, I couldn't quite see it yeah, because of the glare and stuff. But I put my head under the water, just opened my eyes. I was like, right, what do I do? And before I got the net thrown at me with the, with the extender pole on the back of it, right? I thought, in my mind, I'm thinking, I've got to get this fish in because yeah. this is this is make or break for the entire this show. Is the show, yeah. I, I actually it went through my mind, right? So Rich Stewart, who's a very good carp angler, one of the loveliest guys in fishing, you know, he was on the bank doing um, sea cam, so he was the one that got the fish actually sliding over the net, and I shouted up to him because he's really experienced. I went, Rich, what's the chances of me diving down and getting it? Because <laughs> I'm thinking I'm going to dive down, right? I'm just going to handline myself down to this fish, grab hold of it in its snag and come back up, right. holding it like a guitar. Could hold <laughs> I didn't know what, mate, I was totally lost. Yeah, I didn't yeah, know what to do. Right. I was thinking, I'm thinking, <laughs> I, I can see it. It's, it's, it's like eight foot below me and it's, its edge just, I mean, the snags were like this, you know, yeah. big tree roots and it just swum down, poked its head up. I thought, what do I do? And, and then I thought, get the net, I'll try and get his backside in and and I, I accidentally tapped it on the head and it just, it came up. It just, as I analyzed it, like, it came up with like, Whoof. and I was like, I'm back on the rod, but I couldn't, obviously, I was stuck in this 12 foot long banana boat, yeah. stuck under the tree. Yeah. My side was getting all cramped. I couldn't move my legs because it's tiny. Gary went to get the boat. Brilliant story, mate. Brilliant piece of footage, yeah, mate. But again, it was similar to the barbel thing that I said earlier on. Yeah. Like, we'd been on that venue. This was the longest challenge, the longest time we've ever had for, for one challenge on that show. And we had 48 hours. And aside from catching, three or four chub through the night, that was our one moment. Wow. And for that one moment to feel that amount of time, yeah. there's your luck. Because yeah, cool. could, it could easily have been a 20 pounder and I'd have just, you know, yeah, sculled yeah, it straight good. in, you know, hard fighting sort of break or whatever. But yeah, you need moments brilliant, like that. Mate. Absolutely brilliant. In terms of future TV plans, yep. obviously you said you're not in control in terms of commissioning new series, things like that. Is there anything in an ideal scenario for you, yep. what would you like? I love the continental shows, I do, because that's, that's what really inspires my own fishing right now. I, don't get me wrong, I mean, hell, this is the first time I've set foot on Raysbury, yeah. and, and I'd happily get a ticket for this, because you could lose yourself for a decade on this place, you know? Yeah. Um, but, um, 
I, I still think it's important to understand your demographic and the vast majority of people that do watch our shows, mm. they're not, even though it's really easy to jump on a plane for a hundred quid and go out to the Ebro and, and just do some roach and some carp and some, uh, and some catfishing, you know, it's, it's, yeah. the, the whole world is accessible nowadays, yeah, but a lot of people ain't that way inclined. So, I mean, the ideal thing would be to travel the globe and just go after everything that's massive. Mm. I mean, that'd be an absolute dream for me. You know, I think if I won the lottery, I'd, I, I would spend my own money and do that. Would you? Yeah, yeah, free view. Just get a cut and, and film it like fly on the wall, you know. Two guys, you know, and two cameramen I'll and be, just, I'll that's it. I'll be the it. second, mate. You, <laughs> yeah. you need a little. Well, I do, I do, <laughs> just so I can get some extra leg room when you I have to swing that. it round, yeah. You do. But, mate, that's, 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 yeah, that is yeah, an absolute yeah. dream. But I think, you know, in, in all truth, there are talks and we are in very early stages. I might be, I might be blowing the whistle, but who cares? You know, we are thinking about maybe coming back with another fish off, um, but in a slightly different format, a little bit more like me and Ali take a couple of people and stuff, mm. but, but more, of the long, more along the line of when we went to the jungle in the Amazon, where it was wow. an adventure for us, you know, hacking your way through the things. And, you know, sort of if, if, you, if you crossed Bear Grylls with Big Fish off, something, along, something down that middle ground. That's I don't know. Really I don't know. Yeah, exactly. It's just, it's just an idea that's floating around. Because I do know I love, uh, a lot of people love that, yeah. that, that, that competition side of the fish off. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, I, and I'm, I am very much one that, you know, I said it this morning when I fuzz them rigs out, I, just, I always fish the same rigs because I just, you know, I, I try not to correct things if they ain't broken sort of thing. And, and so I don't know whether that's going to be the case for that. I'd like to think there's another shout of, uh, of season three of, of All yeah. Stars. A yeah. um, couple in the UK, a couple on the continent. Um, I, don't, I don't really know, mate, because I've never, I just, I just, I just go with the flow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I'm really, I, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm ever so driven when I'm on the bank doing my bits and bobs. But, you know, I, I am, I'm employed by certain people to do a certain job, you know, to, you know, be a nice guy, catch a few fish, yeah. you know, do the shows, you know, tracker ring me up, guru ring me up, mainline ring me up. Yep, yeah, fine, if I'm free, let's go and do something, you know, because, you know, you guys ring me up. Yeah. Mate, I'm, I know yeah, we're yeah. doing, I know I'm working. My wife's like, oh, you've got to get up at five o'clock tomorrow morning, you know. Oh, bless, stroking yeah. my back when I'm going yeah. to sleep. I'm thinking, I'm going to raise me. It's hard, yeah. <laughs> it's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's spot on. Away from TV, you're fishing nowadays. So obviously we talked about filming and your fishing. How much time do you get? What does your actual own personal fishing look like? It depends on what time of year. So okay. like so when, the, when the kids are off and the summer holidays um, are here, then I don't fish at all um, for, for a couple of reasons, really. I mean, I couldn't think of anything worse than being on the bank when it's 30 degrees. Yeah. You know, no, that's not my thing. I don't yeah. like that. You know, the fish don't like it, nor do I. No. Um, if it kills my appetite, I know that everything else in the world just don't want to feed, right? Um, but at the same token, I do a lot of academy work, you know, so I still do yes. a lot of coaching. I'm still quite heavily involved in the track and field at the grassroots levels. And I also coach coaches and teachers, you know, mm, to spread my, before, yeah, spread my experience, you know? Yeah. Um, but from probably end of September, right the way through till the end of February, I get almost as much time as I want. However, I, I never take the mick. You know, I'm not, I'm not a Monday to Friday, because because of my other work, I have to keep myself in shape. I have to be able to pop over a high jump bar and pop over a hurdle. So training is still a big part of my fishing, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I probably fish at that time of year, three days a week, and it could be anything, you know, I, I could do, you know, three evenings on the River Lee. Yeah. If I've got nothing else to do, because that's my most local river that's got some decent fish in it, you know, I can go and, you know, have a bit of a smash them up up linear. Yeah. I, I've got no tickets and I'm not tied to anywhere, no, you, you know. Go, and, yeah. and it'd be a waste of money if I had, I'm going to get a ticket next year because I've got a couple of pals on the venue. It's got some lovely big fish in it as well, right? Yeah. And, and and I'll set myself a target of maybe three or four seasons on there. But it's really because it's local and my pals are on there and I can just do a quick overnighter. Because yeah. there are times of the year when I think, yeah, just I just want to go and fish for something. You know, I don't want to be getting up for a 15 pounder in the middle of the night if I'm going to work the next day or I'm doing something the next day. But but I don't want two grand worth of tickets and then I end up spending all my year filming. It's, a, yeah, exactly. it's an utter waste of money for me, yeah, you know? So, and, and there's so much decent fishing on day tickets or club tickets that you don't need to spend a fortune. No, no. We talked, we hinted before about sort of continental angling, fishing abroad, Europe. For you, in terms of you've obviously done a bit, where is the, the sort of ideal dream scenario place that you'd want to go and fish i found an absolute gem a few years ago 
and it's unfortunately the river flooded into it a couple of years ago and a lot of them went yeah and they, they were basically these fish were either caught or flooded into this little like landlocked venue and it was like this ever so snaggy but you know UK or not no no this was on the continent oh. yeah and, and it was all boat work and when the fish got flooded into there they were sort of 20 30 pound and they'd grown you know <laughs> they'd gone up they'd gone up to just under yeah. uh, just over 70 pound and there was wow. yeah and they that's not no, exactly. Do you know what I mean? They were wild fish, ever so hard fight. You know, 50 pound braid, 10 ounce leads, proper rainbow yeah. style, you know, up to the snags, locked up tight. And, and it was epic fishing because, I mean, I, I remember losing a fish in open water. I thought it was nailed on that it was just coming to the net. And I lost it on a, a boat, like a ship anchor. And I ended up getting out late that day. I was like, What's that doing there? What are the you know, yeah, and then, and then you go around with the old, like, the, the scope, and there's like a pontoon wow. 10 foot out from the bank, just sunk, like, and you're like, what the, you know, the, an epic, epic venue. And so I suppose we all want to find a place like that. I, I found one and spent three seasons, like a week, a week every year for three years on it. And I was lucky just before I, just before I came off of it, I, I caught the one that everyone was after, really? that everyone thought was already dead anyway, because it just doesn't get caught an awful lot. Yeah, it was, it was, an, it was a real gem. And, um, and I suppose finding little places like that is, is everybody's um, a little slice of heaven. Yeah, and I, I think to a degree I sort of may have found one as well. Up in the mountains, nine mile long, flooded valley, and, and, and up there there's the odd carp, and, and I've, I've heard rumours that they're quite big as well, really lovely. Up in Spain this is, so they, you know, they tend to be scaly, really scaly, beautiful yeah, looking fish, you know. But I fish it for the barbel, the common barbel, but more importantly the camiso barbel. Yeah. And, um, and I've had two trips here, I've got another trip next February and, um, and caught some unbelievable fish you know, from this place. Not easy, my first ever week there, albeit it was ever so cold, but we blanked the entire week. You got no internet, no reception, no phone calls, no nothing. So literally, once you get to the top of the hill, you go, babe, yeah. I'm going, I'll see ya. Yeah, exactly, and I've got a pal that brings us food every two days in a big call box and just yeah. then just disappears, you know, and you're, you're living on a cliff and it's ever so wild. I remember last trip in um, November two years ago, I was, I was on the last morning, I went up the hill, dug myself a hole, put the toilet paper on a little yeah. branch like that, right? And I whipped the old trousers down. I heard a rustle. And I, the only thing I've ever uh, the only thing I've ever seen on this place, right, is vultures on the far bank, which is just a sheer cliff, and no, a wild boar with heads the size of car yeah, bonnets. And scary. I'm like, yeah, I'm thinking, I went, so, it was one of them things where I heard this rustle and it was right there, like right behind me. And I went uh, like a cold sweat and I thought, <sighs> what do I do? So I stood up. And I don't know how it got there. It must have just been sleeping there and stood up in the morning, like heard me. But it was a buck, uh, uh, like a, uh, a buck, you know, like a, just up there, mate. But it's rutting season, isn't it? Oh no! His horns are like I'm, I'm like eye to eye with this thing, and I'm thinking, <laughs> I don't know what. what to, do I didn't know what to do. I, I stood there for probably two seconds, but it felt like a minute. Anyway, I went good, you like this, right? And he, he just bounded over this six foot high bush sort of thing, right? Disappeared. My mate, a like, hundred yards down the down the like the um, the cliff, just going. <laughs> What are you doing? I'm going, shut up, man. I, yeah. I just died nearly, you know, and that sort of venue, Correct. like proper wild yeah. fishing, you know, putting your rods wherever you like, cause you just don't see another person. That's, that's, that's mega, you know. But on the flip side of things, I still love going to places like that, the Premier, where it's simple fishing, 120 yards, as far as you can spawn all week, you know what I mean? And just yeah. fill it in, three rods over the top, lovely jubbly. That sort of, I, I can really, honestly, I can go fishing on a whip for rud up in the water on a, on a nice little pond and, and, and fish for 50 pounders the week after. And, and one of them doesn't give me more pleasure than the other. Yeah, cool. You know, yeah, no, like there's, there's times in my angling when I just want to see a tip go round, you yeah. know, and I'm happy going down somewhere in the winter and just catching some F1s, yeah. you know, little spoon net, you know, little pan net, just unhook them, couple of hours, couple of you know, bending the rod, job done. Right, yeah. And then there's other times when I want to get a bit more serious and I want to go and really yeah. target something special, you know, but, but they all give me the same sort of buzz. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, yeah. brilliant. Um, cliche question. Your most memorable or standout capture that you've ever had? Chubs, are eight pound, yeah, one ounce. Chub. Eight pound, one ounce chub is the best fish I'll ever catch. Unless catch it like two. <laughs> but but it, it's because I was, it's because I caught it with, with three sixes, a seven one and a seven four. Oof. It was an unbelievable session, mate. Unbelievable. That's and I'd a be, pod of chub, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, like or dolphins. yeah, exactly, <laughs> mate. Honestly, they were dolphins. I, I rung Nigel, so yeah. you know, I said about yeah. Nigel Bothway was a calming influence in my fishing. Yeah, you know, helps me sort of not take it too seriously, mate. 
I'm, I've been baiting this area, 10 mil high bridge, just far bank. It was, everyone walks past this spot because it was ever so shallow. You're just a little sort of cove in these bushes. And I was feeding it with 10 millers. And I rung him because you can't fish for these fish during the daylight because you can catch one and then they just all just disappear. Yeah. You've got to wait till dark, right? And um, you wait till dark, you pull it on their heads almost. And I'm ringing him. I'm going, Nigel, they're on it. Like, they're on it, mate. And he's, he's going, what are you ringing me for? Get a rod here. I said, I can't. I'm just ringing people through my phone book. You know, you was the first person to answer. Like, I just need to talk to someone for an hour. To to, yeah, yeah, because I can't sit on my hand sort of yeah. thing, right? Anyway, as I'm speaking to him, two of them, like dolphins, yeah. come up like that and roll. This, this, this spot's only 18 inches deep sort of thing, right? Like this. I'm like, nice, they're massive. Yeah. They're all over. I'm like, lit yeah, absolutely, yeah. And just as the sun's going down, like just about see the far bank, two ounce gripper like this. And it's a horrible spot to fish because all the flow's on like your half of the river. So you've got to, you've got to put a big enough gripper to hold, hold over the far side. Your tip's up in the air. You get, you get loads of liners and all of a sudden it just goes boom like that. And you just wind down the slack and before you know it, it's here. Like, you know. But I had, a, I, I had three sixes, a 7-1, a 7-4 and an 8-1. Wow. And it was unbelievable. But I was just walking up and down. I was lucky because when I actually had the big one, a mate of mine came down to weigh one of the other ones. That I, yeah, that I'd already a dog walker as he was wandering off. He, this was the second fish, the eight one. And so I'd put the six fourteen back or whatever. And and when he slipped down in his motorbike gear to net this thing for me, he went, "How big was the last one?" I went six fourteen. He said, "How big's your PB?" I went seven. Oh, I can't remember what it was. Seven nine or something. And he went. Oh, it's a PB. And I went, get out of it. And he went, yeah, look at that. And held it up. And I was, oh, I was like, oh, lost it. Oh, it was, and it was, it was epic in every way, mate. Yeah. And I remember coming home and they wrote it in the Anglian Times and the way they wrote it was, was even more special than the moment itself. But when I came home, I rung my wife because she'd known I'd, like seven years or something I'd been after this thing. Really? Or, you know, there was, probably, there was a couple on the river, two or three maybe, but you're talking about three, three or 4,000 yards of river, hundreds of snags, you know, and, and sort of four fish that you want. Yeah. You know, so to you know, get one yeah. and a lot of natural food, you know. Yeah. And um, and so I came home and she knew how special it was, right? And I took the measurements and I went, mate, babe, it was 24 and a half inches long. So I measured it out and I drew it. You know, when you draw it in your carpet, you know what I mean? I yeah. went, it was this deep. And anyway, you know, next morning I walked into the living room and I saw the shape of the chub on the floor. And for a split second, I'd forgotten that I'd caught it the night before. You know, I'd woke up in the morning and wanted to get a coffee and stuff. And I was looking at this shape and I'm thinking. Oh my God, I caught that last yeah. night, yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, surreal, and, and, and I've had some huge fish over in Thailand and you know, I was saying that when we went out to the jungle, I was lucky in, in literally a short space of time to catch a, a big 160 pound lao lao, but that eight, that, that chub. That's special, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can tell. Didn't ask a single person anything for seven years and the first two years I blanked my backside off, yeah, mate. Right. I was just in the wrong place. You know, fishing the wrong methods, and and but along the way, caught some amazing fish. You know, it makes it all the sweeter though the journey, doesn't it? Yeah, I think. yeah. It was just, I can't see anything being better than that. Oh. You know, the camiso that I had last year was epic because I'd spent a lot of time sort of looking at venues, trying to get to venues that were sort of a bit more exclusive, where they were 100% camiso. But, but again, I'd still have to go back and say that chub. Yeah, fair play. Along the same lines, slightly different though. Your funniest moment that you've witnessed on the bank doesn't have to pertain to you. Ooh. It could be something you've seen. <clears throat> Ter I'm terrible because things like that happen all the time, and yeah. I just I, I totally I can't remember jokes. No. Do you know what I mean? No. I, I, but they do happen when you're on the bank. You spend, a, especially if you're filming or something in that environment. I suppose, I, 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 I'm the same, mate. I struggle to remember. Stuff. This is where you're going. I'm like I'm going to be thinking about this for like two days, right? And in in two days' time, I'm going to ring you up and tell you an amazing story. But that doesn't make any difference to right now does it what about scariest then oh 100 percent. i was fishing churchwood fisheries many years ago probably around the turn of the century um turn of the century how old do we feel it was, it was 99 2000 ish right but um yeah and um this is before my old mate steve sands who owns it now had it and there's there's three lakes right and i i didn't actually know the owner bill used to run brentwood angling at the time very well but i knew he had a couple of big dogs and he'd invited me down for the night and, and I, I remember barrowing my gear down through this really misty spinny as the sun was going down so it was ever such an eerie place to be yeah. I didn't really know where I was going and I set up on one of the lakes and through the middle of the night I know now that two badgers had a fight behind my behind my brolly right but mate I heard I heard sticks yeah. breaking, teeth yeah. smashing together, and if you've ever heard a couple of badgers oh, fight over cool. some territory, mate, it sounded like two Rottweilers going at it, and it's yeah. it was it was there, and I remember just 
getting a, getting a bank stick like this, just pulling my thing over my head, thinking, oh man, what the what is that? Yeah. And then the next morning, there's just fur everywhere. Do you know what I mean? But that's yeah. the only time I've really ever been scared on the bank. I mean, that yeah. that, that that big deer oh, with yeah, his right. horns. Yeah, mate. I, yeah, I went cold then. I had a cold sweat when that happened because I thought. If this charges me, I've got my pants around my ankles. I don't know what I'm doing. Moon him. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know what to do in that respect, but I, I had many scary moments, to be fair. Yeah, no, that's cool. Well, I'm you know? that way, mate, I think. That's yeah. Right. yeah. I did look my old man in the eyeball, uh, in, the, in the eye when I was a kid. Looking back, it's quite funny. But he, I, remember, yeah, I remember turning round when he was... Um, Oh, I'd done it. It was four pound line, straight through. Whoosh, like that. I was like, what the turn around? He had a little size, whatever it was, 16 and two maggots like that. I looked him right in the eyebrow like that. And um, he gave me some forceps and he went, take it out, boy, like that. And I, I balled my eyes out and I ran about two miles from the lake to me. Uh, my mum used to work in a baker's uh, bakery, right? Grouty's his baker's. And I <laughs> ran all the way and just ran into the baker's and hid behind me. She went, what's the matter? I said, Dad's going to kill me. She went, what's the matter? I said, I've just hooked him in the face with a, with a hook. Yeah, and he had to pick all, he had to pack all my gear up and everything. Poor sod, and he had my little brother as well. It was like full in his eye, though, mate. Yeah, we well, yeah, apparently there's apparently you've got a vein that goes across here oh. that it was quite close to, so it's a good job I didn't whiz it out. But okay, being an all-rounder, difficult mm. question I'd imagine this. If you had to choose one species and one method for the rest of your fishing days, oh. hypothetically the species and the method, it's sustainable. Yeah. Of course it is. Okay, 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 okay. You're not gill netting. No, well, no, I, I just, no, the only reason being is because my favourite way of fishing is, uh, is, is long trotting for chub. Yeah? I just, uh, yeah, I love catching chub on the float. And it's just something, anything really on the float, but chub just because when you're fishing that sort of gear, you yeah. know, the fight isn't explosive or it's, it's not mega exciting. They just open their mouths and they hang there and it's sort of just doof, doof. But the best bit is when you're long trotting from them and you, you know, the loafer just goes woof like that. You big old long strike right back here. You just engage the tip and you got to, it's, it's shutting the bail on when you feel the pressure on your finger and then that big wind down. And that's, that's my favorite way of fishing. But I'll be honest with you, I love hearing those buzzers scream. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, and then sitting, I've always described a barbell bite like going to a rock concert, but having it on mute. You know, everyone's there doing a mosh pit sort of thing, right? But you can't hear anything. Right. And a barbell bite, the rod goes like that. And it, you think it should be making a hell of a yeah, noise. Yeah. It doesn't, it's ever so quiet, but you know something at the end's going, going, going off. So yeah. I, 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 do, I, I do like all styles of fishing, to be fair. Um, I'm gonna take trotting for chub. No, no, but if I, if I could do one thing, you say to me, let's go and do one thing for the day, right? Long trotting for chub in your waders with your, your bait caddy on. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a bit of me, that is, mate. No, but unfortunately, there's not a lot of places you can do it nowadays because no. the rivers are not as healthy as they were. No. Difficult one again. Obviously, life, family, fishing, TV, there's a lot of demands on you. As with everybody else, there's various different demands. How do you balance that whole situation do you struggle sometimes do you blur the lines or have you always been pretty good and pretty disciplined I, i'm i'm lucky mate because my wife doesn't like me that much so I, <laughs> <She's going deep. laughs> no yeah exactly absolutely yeah yeah she <laughs> um no I, my, mate i've got an exceptional missus that yeah. doesn't doesn't mind me going away you know i've got I, in a week's time i'm going away to france with tracker yeah. And then the week after, I drive straight to the call to social for a week. And mm. my missus was like, oh, when did you go to France? And I was like, oh, baby, it's two weeks now. She went, oh, OK, just let me know where you are as long as you're safe. Sweet. She's, she's ever so yeah, good, you know. And so I, 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 I never blur the lines. I've always said to my missus, like, the only time, in fairness, that she's actually said, no, you ain't doing that, was when I got offered a place to go to the Congo to yeah. do some, um, yeah, to do some Goliath um, tiger. tiger fish. Yeah. yeah. And she was like, doesn't sound safe. I went, it's not. You're paying the money because you need to be safe. And she's like, no, you ain't doing that. And I, I like to respect that. And that's fine, you yeah. know, because no fish is worth your life. Even though I've been rowing baits out in thunderstorms left, right and centre, you know, but you I... That, no, of course I haven't. No, 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 no. Um, but, but she's never moaned. That's brilliant. She's never moaned. She knows it's important to me. She knows that if she turned around and asked me, like she, if she said, I mean, again, I know she wouldn't do it, but the fact that she knows I would do it is probably the reason why it's, it's never happened. But mm. she said, I don't really want you to fish anymore. Yeah. I'd sell, sell, sell the gear tomorrow. Yeah. I would. Because fishing's a big part of my life, yeah. but it ain't all my life. No, you know? no. No, too right. Um, here's a bit. Would, what advice would you give somebody 
who would want to follow in your footsteps fishing wise in terms of getting themselves associated with brands into TV? Do it for the right reasons. Do it because you love the sport. There's, I, I get a lot of emails on Facebook, social media, and various different bits and bobs. How can I get sponsored? Well, in, love your love your sport, you know. And you, I, I, I've been lucky in a way because people say I've done it the easy way. Hell, let me tell you, like track and field, and that's not the easy way. You know, going to college and getting a degree or getting you know learning how to work a camera, being a marketing expert, that's a much easier way because yeah, you've got sure. you've got something to give a company. Yeah. That's that's how you do it. Yeah. If you want to do it now, you've got to work in the industry. You've got to take something to the company that they're going to need to utilize. But <clears throat> do it, I've, I've only ever done it because I loved it. Yeah, no, yeah, that's you that is, know? That is great. I've grown to love the filming. The filming was ever so frustrating at the start. I've sure. grown to love that because I accept it a little bit more now. Even though me and the cameramen are always like that, but in a, in a good way, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. I want to go fishing, they want to film, and if we meet in the middle, hopefully it works out, you know? And, and we'll always make a better fishing show the more I'm fishing, yeah. but the more they film, it'll always look better on telly. So it's, 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 it's a never ending story, you know? It's always a fisher circle. but. But I would say if you, yeah, you're probably on to a bit of a hide into nothing if you just want to jump all those runs of the ladders yeah, and just, I, I, I want to get paid to go fishing full stop. Yeah. That, no, no one does that, you know? I mean, every contract that I've got, even if they don't ask, I, I, I try and offer days. Yeah, sure. You know? Nice. I'm always ringing Nighty up saying, I ain't done nothing for you this year. Do you want me to go and do something? Yeah. And he's like, no, nah, you're sweet. And, but I'll always offer, yeah, you know? Yeah, of course. And it is that relationship in the trade because it's not a big it's industry. It's not a big industry, mate. No, it ain't. No. There's a lot of people, but it's a small world. Everyone yeah. knows someone. Too right. You know, you only have to be a D-I-C-K once and everyone right. thinks you're it. Yeah, of course, 100%. Um, so, on From Advice, how has angling as a whole changed since your sort of beginnings to sort of the scene or how angling is now? How do you think it's changed in what ways? Um, well, you know, I mean, you talk to the environment agency and there's less people buying rod licenses, but there seems to be many more people on the bank than when I started, obviously. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> I think it's just more exciting. I mean, I, I tell you where I think angling's gonna go. I think carp fishing or still water fishing, commercial fishing is gonna become a much bigger part because it's easier to maintain, it's easier to protect, yeah. you know? And unfortunately, don't get me wrong, I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm 42, right? But I've not seen I didn't, I didn't see the big death of the, all the perch years and years and years ago. And obviously they've come back and boomed four or five years ago, maybe 10 years ago. And now they're on a slight decline now. They're not yeah. as good as they was, you know? And I think, I think stock markets, fishing, everything does, you know, goes in sort of peaks and troughs. And so hopefully the rivers are sort of just here and, and in 15 years time, they'll be way back up again. But I don't know, I see, I see that they've all got quite a lot of stuff to get around you know yeah. with the cormorants the, the you know the, the crayfish the crabs the, the the otters and everything else so i don't know i just i think it's pond fishing yeah you know yeah, is, yeah. is going to be future. yeah it's going to be the future yeah. because it's manageable Days. what are your opinions on social media and fishing because obviously that's a big sort of development in more recent times uh, yeah brilliant in a way and in you know i mean it's and, and not so good. You know, we, we sort of touched on it earlier. You tend to find that a lot of the serious anglers have the biggest voices or, or, or the most to say. Yeah. And, 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 and me being my personality, and I wish I weren't, you know, I take all of the, the pros of having a TV show on board. And, and, I, and I love replying, thanks mate, thanks mate, da 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 da, retweet that, that's a lovely minute. Oh, I woke the kid up because I was so excited. Yeah, brilliant. But I read into the negative comments more because like I said, I, w I want to try and please everyone, but yeah. you're never going to, no, you know, but I try, as long as it's constructive criticism, that's fine. But you just do get, social media, I think, in the, in the, on the whole, is, a, is an epic thing. It brings so many people together. It makes the world a much smaller place, you know, and for the vast majority of it, and I mean 98%, I get so much good feedback that I love it, you know, but, you're gonna just get the ones that are always, I call it unsocial media. Unsocial. Unsocial anti social media. Little anti social media, yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's a, it's a fake profile. They're 50 years old. They're sitting indoors with their parents. Mum's calling them yeah. down for dinner, and the only girlfriend they've had, they've had to blow up. You know, nice. you know I'm talking straight nice. to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but they know who they are. that's how I like to think of them. They're probably, yeah. they're probably really cool guys that just yeah. want to get something off their chest. I don't know, I don't know. Maybe, no. maybe, maybe their wife's an absolute nightmare and they've got ugly kids. 
<laughs> you watch, I'm gonna <laughs> you watch, I'm just gonna <laughs> get some absolute I'm gonna get absolute, Yeah, I don't mind. I'll just <laughs> Do you have any burning ambitions or desires within the sport of fishing to help promote it, take it to future generations, or sort of I don't know, pave the way, if you like, for, for what hopefully will become the future of our sport. It is, you know, it's, it's interesting you say that because obviously we've got the Match Academy that all the gurus do. Um, I was heavily involved in that. Well, I say heavily involved. I was as heavily involved as a consultant gets yeah. um, in the start of that. Unfortunately, it's run through the summer holidays now when I'm yeah. doing a lot of my other coaching from track and field. you got the Carp Academy that called to do. Yeah. And so I'm involved with companies that do an awful lot. And I try to get involved with their projects as, as much as I possibly can. Yeah. And part of my track and field job, consultancy role in a way, is helping the grassroots understand the fundamentals of how to become better all-round athletes. Now, I'm not anal enough to think they're all going to want to be the next Dean Macy, Jessica Ennis, or, or, or whatever, yeah. you know, but just being a good all-round athlete yeah. helps you in whatever sport you're ever going to do, yeah, you know. Cool. And, and, and so it's a massive passion of mine in my other side of the career. And, it would be a massive passion in mine if I had time to do so sure. in fishing. But it is a bit of a worry because you don't see too many youngsters coming through. But again, that's one of the reasons why I try to make entertaining shows. Yeah. As, me as an angler, I want to make a fishing show. You know, yeah. I want to show people what I can go and do in some really harsh environments. I want to show them some of the fish that I catch on my own personal sessions because they're epic. They would make for some fantastic shows, but they don't make for brilliant entertaining family TV sure. and I think the fun sort of side of the shows that we do and um, and the fish off has very much helped families come together because the vast majority of the shows the dad watches yeah. maybe the dad and the son yeah. but now you've got the dad the son the daughter and the wife yeah. and the sister and, and you know and the auntie coming round and, and bigger audience yeah exactly and entertainment value yeah and so I, th I think we can all do more but at the end of the day when I'm finished working and this is going to sound selfish, I want to go fishing yeah. for me because, because of, at the end of the day, I'm in this position yeah. because all I've ever wanted to do is go fishing. Yeah, yeah of course. You know, I, be, life, because, yeah. I, because I love yeah. that side of it. You know, I come home from a week's filming and I want to go fishing. Yeah, completely. I sort of want to go yeah. back to where I've normally been to spend the right time of the day on the venues to catch, the fish, catch the fish that I saw but I couldn't catch, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, last question before we go into a, a finish up with a quick fire round, Ooh, mate. I love on him. The last question is, if you had to choose athletics or fishing, mm -hmm. to get rid of one completely off your career, life, whatever, which one would you keep, which one would you get rid of? Right now? Yeah, right now, this spot. I'd get rid of athletics. Medal's gone the lot. Well, you didn't say that. Yeah, it's old yeah, thing. It's so gone. Got, like, give me the history. Either your medals are gone or your rods are gone. Oh, no. You've got to pick it now. No, in that respect, it'd have to be fishing. And I'll tell you why. Because, like, we've got six rods out at the moment. Not not to mention the ones in the other. <laughs> what, the cameraman do the bait? <laughs> yeah, that's it, yeah. But, well, we've got six rods out at the moment, and it's anybody's guess which one's going to go off. Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, don't get me wrong. You put three rods on the spot. I'll put three rods on the spot. You know, couldn't really have fished any better to a degree. Yeah. But if me and you went and raced, there's no question. You know? I know, I'm rapid. And so, and so <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, pro I probably wouldn't make the end of the race to stake my entries. Mate, but, but the thing is, right, in fishing, everyone has their day. You know, yeah, there is an element of luck. All right, the people that have the red letter days the most are obviously doing something right more often than the small percentages and all that. I get that, right? Yeah. You know, and I, 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 you know, I, I try and get that into my fishing as much as possible, but but, but there ain't no luck. Mate. Mm, yeah. You don't make it to an Olympic team or don't get to no. a world champs just by right place, right time. And you, also the fact that it's an individual sport, you can, there's a lot of people that in team sports can hide or be, be good players, but they're yeah. obviously, the team element comes into play where they can compensate. You're on your own there, mate. I if, can imagine if, if you're having a shocker, that must be a lonely place. I would imagine so, but yeah. didn't really. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah take that. <laughs> <laughs> right, quick fire round to end on. As quick as you can. Go no on. thinking, conferring, or anything else, mate. Go no phoning a friend. Three words to describe yourself. Powerful, sensitive, handsome. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> well, the first two are true anyway. The Tinder profile. Um, <laughs> one thing that you couldn't live without? My wife. Best bankside food? Any. <laughs> nice. Yeah, you do like food. Mate, on the bank, everything tastes good, right? Anything <laughs> but part... Oh, mate, peanut bar. 
It's my only thing I won't eat. Wrong. In every jar Yeah, the only th yeah, I've only got a jar of peanut butter in the garage because it's great for catching mice. <laughs> yeah, they love it. Uh, best angler you've shared the bank with? Steve Ringer. Ooh, favourite venue? Ooh. Home and abroad? Uh, let's do home and abroad, yeah, let's do it. Okay, ab uh, abroad. Oh, mate. My little old pit, the place I was telling you about, the little secret place that was, you know, it's, it's like a tiny little rainbow. Secret old rainbow pit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Home. She said quick, didn't you? She's quick fire. I do like the River Wye. The River Wye. Yeah, get in touch Take with that. the Wye and Us Foundation. You, you book the stretch, it's all yours. You can bait swims, rove, rove around and just job. It's stunning, beautiful, and you, you're almost certainly going to catch something. Brilliant. Final question. Go on. Your greatest achievement in life, in Macy? Mate, when I left school, my ambitions were pretty low, all right? I wanted to make it to 40 years old without having a proper job. Tick. I mean, don't get me wrong, I worked very hard when I, I worked, say. but it ain't a proper job, is it? And I wanted to own a 1.6 injection gear Orion, which I did when I was like 19. Proper Mega. Essex boy chav, yeah. That is Essex. Though. Two 10 inch band pass subs in the boot. It was so loud, my, my number plate fell off once. <laughs> boom, 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 that was me. Lowered it 50 mil as well. Um, that was your greatest, that can't be your greatest achievement in life. Greatest achievement in life. The old quick fire rounds come up again, hasn't it? I'm not that quick, mate. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough question. Yeah. Yet, yet to, yet to yet be to achieved. Be achieved. Yet to be I achieved. Like that. I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Good. I like that, Dean. An absolute privilege to spend some time on the bank to Cheers, do that mate. interview with you, mate. You thank are you, an mate. absolute legend, a hero. Um, thank you for watching, and we'll see you all again soon with another catch up. <laughs>